Welcome back once again. So for the final part of lecture four, we're going to give the mathematics a break. Well, pretty much give it a break and examine rotational rheometers. We've now looked at capillary rheometry. We've understood how we can use capillary rheometers to measure the material properties of any arbitrary fluid and how we can correct for pressure drops and so forth. We will see next lecture we can do a very similar analysis for rotational machines. But for the remaining part of this lecture, we're just going to meet some rotational machines with some slightly different geometries to those of Kuwait cells. Now, capillary rheometry and rotational rheometry are beautifully complementary techniques. Capillary rheometry is really well suited for high shear rate measurements. You can use quite narrow, quite long capillaries, generate high pressure drops, which correspond to high wall shear rates. And so you can get a very good characterization of, for example, shear thinning behavior. Capillary rheometers are also contained. So as we'll see in a minute, when you try and investigate high shear rates on rotational rheometers, you don't always get the results that you're hoping for. So in terms of rotational rheometers, they're very good at the lower shear rate range. Typically, rather than having a cuvette cell, which is not going to work very well practically for very viscous fluid. How do you fill it up, for example, without including lots of air bubbles? Or if you fill up a hollow cylinder and then place the inner cylinder inside for a viscous liquid, how do you actually get it to penetrate? For very viscous liquids, what we tend to use are either cones and plates or parallel plates and put a liquid in between them. And so we're going to look at strain rate expressions for both of those tool geometries. The problem with parallel plates and conan plates is that as they spin faster and faster, they exert a centripetal force on the fluid contained within them, which means that above a certain rotation rate, you tend to spatter the fluid all over the interior of the rheometer, hence losing your sample and losing your ability to make any material property measurements. So capillary rheometers are good at high shear rates, Rotational rheometers are typically good at low shear rates, and you would use experimental data from the two different rheometers to make a characterization of material property over a broad range of shear rates. So let's have a look now at two different rotational rheometer tools and develop some strain rate expressions for them. So here on the blackboard is a schematic diagram of a typical parallel plate setup. What I've marked on there is that the bottom plate is rotating at known angular velocity. The top plate is held perfectly stationary and we're measuring the torque that develops on that top plate. We use a very sensitive transducer to measure that, typically something called a force rebalance transducer. We're not going to go into the mechanics of those transducers in this lecture, but they're very elegant electromagnetic devices. The angular velocity on the bottom plate is set very accurately. Typically, we're talking a high accuracy stepper motor to drive that bottom plate. In between the two plates, there is a gap. And on this slide, in that gap, I've placed a fluid, which is that yellow shape. And that's the fluid that we wish to test, again, of arbitrary rheology. So we move the bottom plate. We measure torque on the top plate. Now, I said that we rotate the bottom plate as our deformation, which is, of course is one of the deformations that we can do. We can, of course, also do other deformations. We can just step change the position of that bottom plate, putting instantaneous strain on the fluid. We can also oscillate that bottom plate, which is an analysis we're going to look at in detail next lecture. And typically, oscillatory or dynamic measurements give us insight into viscoelastic properties. And so rotational rheometry, when used in an oscillatory sense, is a very powerful tool for the characterization of viscoelasticity. But let's start simply. So we can use rotational rheometers in two different modes, in a controlled stress mode or a controlled strain mode. If we think of the controlled strain mode first, what we're doing is setting a strain rate. We're setting gamma dot, and we do this by means of accurately setting the rotation rate, the angular velocity. 
For controlled stress mode, we do something a little more complicated. For example, if we have a fluid with a yield stress, a viscoplastic material, we'll see in future lectures that the material won't deform significantly below a certain stress. But what we really want to find out is the stress at which the fluid starts to deform. And so, ideally, what we want is an ability to say, rheometer, exert certain stress on this sample, not angular velocity, because if you're exerting an angular velocity, you've already yielded the material because it has to flow. So there's a feedback loop in certain rheometers that allow you to program in a certain stress. It looks at the torque developed and relates that back to the stress that is put on that bottom plate. It's typically you're just applying a stress, a rotational stress, which is then measured as a torque and then via a feedback loop you can measure and control what that stress is. So controlled stress mode, very, very useful for the characterization of viscoplastic fluids. Controlled strain mode, very useful for the characterization of generalized Newtonian and viscoelastic fluids. The previous slide on the blackboard illustrated two parallel plates. An ideal geometry that we might want to use is not actually two parallel plates, it's a cone and a plate where the plate moves and the cone is held stationary. The divergent angle of the cone, theta, on the blackboard is typically very, very small. Let's see why this is an ideal geometry to use, first of all. Let's examine what the rate of strain, gamma dot, is on the fluid in the gap. So let's think of gamma dot z theta. Remember, this is a strain rate on the z face in the theta direction. OK, and Z here is the rotation axis. It's going to be the difference in velocity across the gap divided by the height of the gap. And so if we think about a moving bottom plate at a given radius R, the linear velocity is just simply R omega. So VZ theta, V theta is R omega. The top plate is held stationary. And so if we think about the velocity differential across the gap, it's going to be the difference in velocity, r omega minus zero, divided by the height. And the height at any arbitrary radius is r tan theta. Now remember we said that theta is small. So we can simplify the expression for strain rate as omega over tan theta, or approximately omega over theta. This is an important result because this states that for small cone angles theta, our strain rate, gamma dot z theta, is constant across the fluid. So every part of fluid is exposed to the same strain rate, so we get an accurate characterization. Brilliant! There's a but, because what we want to ensure is that the gap between the cone and the plate is full of fluid. If we've got a very, very viscous fluid, especially a polymer melt, that might be nigh on impossible to achieve because you've got to somehow press that cone into a highly viscous fluid which has got to deform outwards and just may simply not deform outwards. If it's highly viscoelastic it might deform outwards to start with and then under stress memory contract again. So for certain classes of fluid cone and plate tools are not particularly pragmatic to use and so we have to revert to parallel plates. Now, parallel plates are a lot easier experimentally to deal with. If you're looking at a molten polymer, typically what you'd do is you'd cast a solid sheet of polymer, stamp out a disc in a press, put the disc between the two parallel plates, put the parallel plates in an oven, melt the disc, and perform your rheology experiments. Brilliant. OK, so why aren't parallel plates as good? Let's examine what's going on. Remember, it's a bottom plate that is rotational, and the top plate that is stationary, and let's again look at my strain rate expression. So remember, it's a velocity gradient, which is going to be the velocity of the bottom plate at a given radius, which is r omega, divided by the gap between the bottom and the top, which in this case is constant at h. And so we can see very straightforwardly that my shear rate, gamma dot z theta, is now a function of radius. And so we have different parts of fluid being subject to different rates of strain. 
a zero rate of strain in the centre, because when r equals zero, r omega equals zero, through to a high rate of strain at the outer edge of the plate when r equals big R. And if we think about, for example, measuring the torque developed on the top plate in a highly shear thinning fluid, that means different bits of fluid are going to be presenting different apparent viscosities, and the torque that we measure is therefore an average of all the fluid behaviour. So it's not ideal, but we'll see how we use this for a fluid of arbitrary rheology later. So, as with capillary rheology, we need to introduce a datum point. Our datum for our capillary was the shear rate at the wall, gamma dot w, where you had the stress developed at the wall, tau w. Here what we look at is the shear rate at the edge of the plate, gamma dot subscript big R, and that is going to be our reference point when we do subsequent analysis. So, let's have a few key points. We've looked at rotational rheometry for geometries other than cuets. We've seen that rotational rheometers can operate in controlled stress for viscoplastic characterization, or controlled strain for generalized Newtonian and for viscoelastic characterization. You can have cone and plate tools, parallel plate tools, cuet tools, vein tools, and so on. There are a variety of different geometries that you can put in a rotational rheometer. And you can vary the deformation of the mobile plate differently as well. You can have a constant angular velocity, you can have a sudden change of position, a step strain, and you can have an oscillation. We'll be examining the response of all three of those deformations when we consider viscoelastic liquids later on in this course. We've seen that the cone and plate tool is ideal because our shear rate is constant throughout our fluid. From a pragmatic standpoint, if we have fluids of very high viscosity, it may be very hard or impossible to get good material contact between the top cone and the bottom plate and ensuring that the material fills the entirety of the gap between the two. Parallel plates, we find that our shear rate is a function of radius, which is non-ideal, but pragmatically it's very easy to get material contact fully between top and bottom plate for high viscosity liquids. And so the choice of tool is going to be a compromise.